<clears throat> I'm pushing at the second part of the homework at best afterwards. And then I don't really understand what the problem is. <laughs> or if I look it up, and either the authors will just write out the answer, or they'll argue by current conservation and rents and variance that the form that you need is the one that should be deriving. Well, let's see. The, the, what I meant was for you to follow the example that I um, did for the scalar field mm -hmm. in um, in the some of the online notes. Okay. Um, and in fact, I think I did it in class. You may have. It, it, yeah, the, the deal is. With, uh, Every one of them is shattered. Oh. All right. Um, oh, you, th you take the one that's not, and you from uh, you just found the strongest one really quickly by dropping the whole box. If you if there are any in there that are still around, you, that's the that's the quickest way to find them. Yeah, but then sampling out the box at random is not a good. <laughs> yeah, right. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll 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 pass <laughs> on all that. Um, <laughs> Okay, the idea is that we've got certain terms in Lagrangian that are counter terms, these extra terms. And so uh, we just compute the Feynman amplitude with those extra terms as well as the terms that we've been using. In other words, we have L0, L1, L2, and L is equal to L0 plus L1 plus L2. So you just want the, the Q to Q amplitude. Right. What, whatever for amplitude. L, for that part right, of the right, right, yeah. right, right. Now that you're bringing it back to me because I've, I've forgotten a little bit. The homework problem that we're talking about is really the amplitude for one photon to go to one photon. Right. Okay. And the deal is that these counter terms give diagrams that look like this. That's yeah, the way they're typically drawn. So what, is, <laughs> what does that X mean? Because I saw that in one of the books. Right. The X means that we're talking about something like minus, this is just off the top of my head because I don't have these notes with me, Z3 minus 1 um, D mu um, A nu minus D nu A mu Something like that. Okay. And um, so this term gives you, if you use this term as though it were one of the interaction terms, and you compute the thing, you get a contribution in first order perturbation theory rather than second order. Whereas the, the elaborate thing we calculated when we calculated pi, that was in second order when we had. Well, this is a contribution to pi, right? The total pi. Yes. So the, 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 the total pi is this plus that. Right. OK. And so um, The idea is that you look in, you use this in first order and imagine what it would contribute to the calculation of this in second order. In other words, you put the two together and then you see that, um, you see how it is that it, that it works out. So, so that's the end. So I guess we're going to postpone the homework to Wednesday. Well, I can do it after this. <laughs> we'll say we'll postpone the homework to Wednesday. Okay. I forgot to put the date Monday on the web page. Oh, so. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I'm such a procrastinator. It's absolutely. Uh, my advice, however, to everybody is. Don't procrastinate.
There's only one case and it's useful to procrastinate, actually. I was once, when I was a long time ago, I was at the National Bureau of Standards, and I heard one, one of the very senior people there said, never sell anything. He was talking about stocks. Mm -hmm. And um, this, it, it, you don't, it's actually a pretty good rule to follow. Um, and in particular, the one thing you don't want to do, unless you really know what you're doing, is tax loss. Selling it a little bit. Or I decided that it was probably a good idea to do some of that philology that you mentioned. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it um, whereas Weinberg always does things in complete generality, I'm going to do it in a, in, in a simple case where you can actually see what's happening. And, um, before that, though, I, I want to do some uh, other things that he also does at the beginning of chapter 10. Um, first of all, let's recall the, the commutation relation for a field with the fall momentum and it's I partial partial x upper mu of A of x. Here, A is just any old field. Okay, it doesn't mean the electromagnetic field. It could be the electromagnetic field, but it's basically any old field. And that means, in particular, that A of X transforms as E to the minus I PX, A of zero, E to the I PX. These, so this is, this is the Heisenberg field, basically. Fully and I don't know why I'm doing it. Was, was there a question? There was a question. Wasn't there? All right. No. We have a homework question. This is not. Sorry. Did somebody else have some questions? Okay. All right. Um, okay. So let's, let's consider P prime. Let's just take the commutator, P prime, A mu, and now I'm going to do the time order product of A of X1, A of X2. Commutator, P. Now Weinberg does this for the most general case where it calls for N of these. And these are eigenstates of the full, handle, full energy momentum operator, in particular eigenstates of the handle commutator. With fall momentum p prime or p, not necessarily one particle states, but just states of that momentum. Okay, well the commutator of that with the time order product, and then, as I said, in general you'd have n fields here, but be much it's much simpler and easier to write down if you have two, and it basically tells the story. Well, this of course is equal to um, P prime minus P mu times P prime time order product A of X1, A of X2, P. On the other hand, it's also equal to P prime, and now let's just put in the time order product, it's theta of X1, 0 minus X2, 0 times A of X1, A of X2, plus theta of X2, 0 minus X1, 0, A of X2, A of X1, commutator P. And now, um, this of course means that it's P prime theta x1 0 minus x2 0 commutator P mu ax1 ax2 plus I guess I'm being a little too explicit here
So are you just saying that time ordering can be pulled out of the commutator? Sure. Because it's a function and this is an operator. There is a tricky point in the moment, which is also a case for things commute. Okay, well, the, the commutator of a product, say just P A B, of course, is the commutator of P with A times B plus A times the commutator of P with B. So this is just always true. And so this is P prime theta x10 minus x20 P mu AX1 AX2 plus AX1 P mu AX2 and B and then another term, which is just the same, with x2 replaced by x1. Okay, so that's what it is. Now we use this formula over here, the commutator of the ball momentum of any field is I times the derivative of the field. That's because the ball the momentum operators generate translations. And so what we've got then is P prime. Theta x10 minus x20 big parenthesis, and this is going to be I d by d x1 times A of x2 plus A of x1 I d x2 mu A of x2 And then the same thing with two replacing one. Parts to put the D on the other side of the, or do you need to? 
Are we talking about the derivative? They're not integrating at all. This is just are we talking about the derivative of the theta function or this ordering? Let me write it this way. Effectively, these are just orthogonal variables. So at this point, then, what we've got is p prime minus p mu times p prime time order product a of x1, a of x2, B is equal to I d by dx 1 u plus d by dx 2 u d prime time order prime ax1 ax2 b. So that's, um, that's the equation that we get. And now, the, the solution here is a little bit surprising and a little bit odd. It's that that this is equal to e to the i p minus p prime dotted into, and, and here's what's odd, C1x1 plus C2x2, or let me, let me write it, let me write it more simply for this particular case. When there are only two, it's possible to write this a little bit more simply. Cx1 plus 1 minus Cx2 times some arbitrary function x of f1 minus x2. Well, not arbitrary, it's a particular function, but it only depends upon x1 minus x2. Okay, why is this the case? Well, um, if we differentiate i d by d, d by dx1 mu plus d by dx2 mu. Acting on this, we're going to get the d by dx1 is going to pull down, so on e to the i, p minus p prime. Let's just do this part first. cx1 plus 1 minus cx2. Let's just do this. And d by dx1 pulls down minus p minus p prime uh, times c with a lower mu. And then this one pulls down minus 1 minus c p minus p prime mu. And all together, the, the C terms cancel, and what we get is P prime minus P mu of oh, times, all is times, of course, the exponential, E to the I, P minus P prime, CX1 plus 1 minus C, X2. And then, of course, times the exponential, sorry about that. Okay, so, so what we see is that this structure 
gives the right thing as far as the exponential is concerned. And then, when this differential operator hits a function of the difference, you just get zero. That's what we saw over here. That d by dx1 mu plus d by dx2 mu on any function of x1 minus x2 is zero. Because this gives f prime, this one gives f prime, this one gives minus f prime. All right, so in other words, the, the time-ordered product between two momentum eigenstates is of the form e to the i p minus b prime a linear combination of the coordinates with, co with but, but such that the sum of the two coefficients vanishes. No, no, is unity, is unity. And then a function of the difference. Right. And what happens if we take the Fourier transform? Well, d4 of x1, d4 of x2. e to the minus i k1 x1 minus i k2 x2 t prime t ax1 ax2 t. And I'm going to call this g of k1 K2. Well, this is an integral d4 of x1, d4 of x2, e to the minus i k1 x1 minus i k2 x2, plus i p minus p prime dot, and I'll just write it as cx1 plus 1 minus c x2 times some f of x1 minus x2. Okay. All right, so I'm going to set y equal to x1 minus x2, and then so that x1 is equal to y plus x2, and so g of k1, k2 then is integral d4 of y, d4 of x2, e to the minus i k1 y plus x2 minus i k2 x2 plus i p minus p prime. And now I have to write this correctly because I just I changed the notation on the board from in my notes. It's um, c x1 is y plus x2 plus 1 minus c x2 and times f of y. All right. The dx2 integration we can do easily. This gives us a delta function. Delta 4 of, and what is it? Well, x2 has coefficient 1, and so we get p minus p prime, and then minus k1 minus k2. And then integral d4 of y, e to the i, minus p prime
point here is that this is some function of um, y, obviously. And um, the key point, though, is that there's an overall delta function. Because this overall delta function means that, that the matrix element conserves um, ball momentum. And because that's basically from this equation here, something like that. That's just anyway, so that's that's the that's the um, if, if one of the one of them, the total thing conserves ball momentum, right? The total thing, yes. So this doesn't say that this A field conserves it's, ball momentum. It, it's 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 that time order product. It's these guys here. Right, yes, good point. I owe you a chocolate. Um, right, because there's no specific momentum associated with this thing. There's only momentum associated with P prime, the initial and final states. But then when you Fourier transform, you introduce a certain uh, momentum. And so this is the conservation momentum. And more generally, if you have a matrix element P prime, time order product, A of x1, and of course this can be A1 of x1, An of xn, P, and then you take a Fourier transform, P4 x1, P4 xn, E to the minus i, Ki, xi, sum from 1 to n, of course. This is going to be proportional to delta fourth of, and it's going to look just like this, p minus p prime, and then minus k1 minus k2 minus kn. Um, you can have similar results for internal symmetries like charge. Q uh, plus 
q1 plus q2 times e prime times one prime ax1 ax2 p is zero. So I'm just adding this to both sides. And so that tells you that this matrix element vanishes unless the charges are conserved. And now it, it really does say that. Um, whereas in the moment in the case it didn't quite say that. Okay, so now um, now we're going to go to the case of um, that's a little more interesting, namely Um, the case of uh, discovering a pole in an amplitude, and again, I'm going to take, I'm going to pick a case that's simple enough so that we can really see what's going on. Whereas Weinberg's general proof, it's. Um, he had such symbolic powers that he can look at an equation that has 5,000 symbols and he sees it as uh, a simple, clear statement. For human beings, other human beings, um, it's better to, to deal with the simplest non-trivial case. And so that's what I'm going to do. All right, well, this is obviously theta x1, 0, minus x2. 2, 0, vacuum, and 1. And of course, when I write this as A of x1, A of x2, I've been writing, I've been just using, in general, just one symbol A. Of course, I should have used A1 of x1, A2 of x2. It wouldn't have made any difference in the translation of variance. It did make a difference in the charges, which is why I had to put in the subscripts. Here, it's not going to make any difference explicitly, but assume that I really have A1 of X1, A2 of X2, and A is an arbitrary P. Okay, so this is it. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to be focusing in on a particular case, namely where uh, we can put in a sum of the immediate states and see that, um, in fact, it would probably be a good idea to put in these subscripts at this point. Well, I don't know, maybe, all right, imagine they're there, but don't not worry about it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put, put in complete sets of states in both cases, but I'm going to focus on, I'm trying to find a pole in this thing. And uh, to find the pole, if the pole occurs here, great, that's the pole. It also occurs over here, even better, but we're just trying to find one pole. So I'm going to focus on the first term, namely, And I'm going to insert a complete set of states. So I'm going to say that this, so I'm going to focus on this term here. And ignore this for the moment and then insert a complete set of states. All right. And now what we're going to do is we're going to look for a one particle state, a state of momentum P. And the reason why one particle is, is involved here is that if you have a two particle state, then there's a whole, there's a, there's a whole infinity of two particle states that can have the same four momentum, or at least the same three momentum. So so 
So I'm going to fo focus on this, this particular case and um, of course since we're summing over this, uh, what we'll have here is integral p cubed p, 0 a of x1, p, p, a of x2, 0. Okay. And I'm going to forget about the rest of the sum over intermediate state for all those other terms. What other terms? And recall that a of x1 is e to the minus i px1 a of 0 e to the i px1. Consequently, this thing is equal to an integral dqp 0. Well, maybe I should write this explicitly. This is e to the minus i p the, mo p the full momentum operator x1 a of 0 e to the i p x1 p p uh, e to the minus i px2 a of 0 e to the i px2 0. I haven't left anything out. P on this gives just 0. P on that gives 0. So in other words, the unitary operator just turns into the identity operator. On the other hand, P on P gives us uh, a P and a minus P there. So this is in fact equal to an integral dqp, 0, a of 0, p, p, a of 0, 0, times e to the i, p, x1 minus x2, where now p is little p, it's this p here. Okay, so what we have is time order product a of x1, a of x2 is beta x1 0 minus x2 0 integral dqp 0 a of 0 p squared e to the minus i p x minus x1 plus other terms. And the other terms are, first of all, terms where the heavy side function has the opposite argument, and then all the other intermediate states that could go in there. And the fact that we have this term at all only uh, is true if, and let me put these subscripts back in, 1, 2, only if there's a one particle state such so that a1, 0, p is not equal to 0, and such that p, a2, 0, 0 is not equal to 0. So in fact, um, this really is a shorthand that's a little too short because if one is different from two then this is not what we have. And so what we're really saying is that there's a one particle state such that all of these things is non-zero. And I guess I should, I, I really shouldn't use this um, notation. I should have written it a little more explicitly. So I'll, I'll try to do that um, so, uh, further on. Now, um, we're not going to drop the theta function entirely. And in fact, we're going to use the fact that theta of tau is minus 1 over 2 pi i integral minus infinity to plus infinity d omega e to the minus i omega tau over omega plus i epsilon. Okay. 
So let's see. Um, I'm thirsty, and I owe you a chocolate. So, does anybody else need a chocolate? So now this is how we're going to find the polls. What? This is how we're going to find the polls. I'm going to go to my next one, so let's give you the next question. We're going to look for the poll right now. Yeah, in fact, you're right. That's right there is where the polls come. So let me. This is not the most commonly used expression. So let's just look at where the poll is in that expression. It's uh, a little bit below the. This is the complex. Omega plane, it's a little bit below the origin there of the complex omega plane. We're integrating like this. Okay. If pola is positive, then if omega has a big negative imaginary part, this thing, we can add a ghost contour like this. Because then, down here, omega is minus i times infinity. And we have a minus i. Minus i minus i is minus 1. We have a minus infinity. We can add that. That means we've just got an integral, uh, a loop integral in the complex plane. The function's analytic everywhere except for this pole. We can shrink it down to that. And that gives us. One, if pole is greater than zero, and pole is less than zero, then we can add a ghost contour in the positive, in the upper half plane, and indeed we just get zero because there's no pole there at all. So that shows that this, in fact, is the heavy side function. I wonder if. I mean, this man on heavy side, um, I wonder if, if he thought of this function because his name was heavy side. I mean, this is a function with one side that's heavier than the other. Zero to the left. Um, there's a, uh, in the New York Review of Books, there are, there are many amusing articles by Weinberg, of course, but also by Dyson. And um, Dyson was at Cambridge when he was young. And um, he has some stories about some of the great Cambridge mathematicians, Hardy and Heaviside and so forth, that are quite funny. One or two of them were Christians, and some of the others were atheists. And in particular, one of the atheists, I think, was Hardy. He was making fun. Uh, the Christians, it's hysterical. Maybe I'll try to find a room. Okay, so this is our heavy side function, and uh, view of the time. I think I maybe should try to move. Have I been going too slowly? No. Yes. No. no? Okay. No, no. Sometimes I guess it's useful. All right, so um, what is our time on a chart? It's that expression there, and let's put in, let's put this thing in, minus 1 over p pi i, integral minus infinity to plus infinity, p omega, e to the minus i omega, x10 minus x20. So that's that's this term here. We're leaving out the other one. That's the other terms. And we have integral dqp. And we have 0, a1 of 0, p. And I'm going to write it correctly this time. a2 of 0, 0. So in the online, they're not online yet, but in the online notes, imagine <coughs> that I'm writing it this way rather than e to the minus i p x1 minus x2 plus other terms. Okay, so <coughs> this is what it is. But now this is what the time order looks like. So there's also a denominator, right? 
and then uh, the denominator. Oh, thank you. Gosh, all right. And then this this exponential term at the end has a different sign over here and over here. Duh. Yeah, I just didn't read my notes. All right, I, I owe you a chocolate. All right, so this is what we've got, but now we're going to go into momentum space, just as we did over there. But we're going to use Q instead of K for some reason. So now we have G of Q1 and Q2. Integral D4 of X1, D4 of X2, e to the minus I, Q1, X1, minus I, Q2, X2. Vacuum, time order product, A1, X1, A2, X2, vacuum. Okay. Now, by the way, let me just say that the in the in the, in the general case, which I'll allude to briefly or uh, later, you have n fields and you have an arbitrary eigenstate of momentum on both sides. And I just want to do this this and simply so that we can see what's going on. Okay, so this thing then is minus 1 over 2 pi i, integral d omega, minus infinity plus infinity, e to the minus i omega, x1 0 minus x2 0, omega plus i epsilon, integral dqp, 0, d 0, d Minus i p x2 minus x1 minus i q1 x1 minus i q2 x2. D4 x1 d4 x2 plus other terms. Again, the other terms are for, with, for the opposite theta function and for all the other terms that we left out. Okay, um, all right, well, if we gather these things together, first of all, the time occurs here but every, but, uh, by itself, whereas over here we have four-dimensional integrals. Uh, we can do the space parts of these immediately and they give us delta functions. And so this is minus 1 over 2 pi i, integral d omega, e to the minus i omega x1 0 minus x2 0, omega plus i epsilon, integral d q p, And then we get 2 pi to the 6. Each of the spatial integrals gives you 2 pi q times the delta function. And the delta functions are delta of q1 and uh, p. So you can think of it as p minus q1, delta q, and then delta q of um, plus q2 um, or minus p minus q2 the delta function is even okay so that's what we've got and we can use this delta function to do this p integral and then and so that gives us minus 1 over 2 pi i integral the omega e to the minus i omega x1 0 minus x2 0 
zero omega plus i epsilon. And now we just have zero, a one of zero, uh, q1, q1, a two of zero, zero. P, well that's Q1, isn't it? Plus Q2. Q1 and Q2 are just arbitrary variables because we put them in symmetrically, they come out asymmetrically. One is the uh, is minus what will be a physical momentum. So is there still there's still an integration over x10 and x20? Yes. Brilliant. No, I didn't. I didn't drop it from the notes. I, I did the integrals. Okay, do the integrals. If you do the integrals, then you still have the time component parts of this, right. and the time components parts of that are then plus i p zero um, x two zero minus x one zero. We're using the closed Weinberg metric plus i q one zero x one zero plus i q two zero x two zero. That's all in this exponential. All right. Okay. Well, that gives us. Minus one over two pi i integral in omega one over omega plus i epsilon um zero a of zero one. things in a different order in the notes, so this is a little bit tricky here. Well, it's 2 pi to the 8 now. Delta of omega plus P0 minus P10, delta of omega plus P0 plus P20. And by the way, P0 is the square root of q one vector squared plus m squared, where m is the mass of this intermediate state, this one particle state that we put in there. And one of the points Weinberg makes um, forcibly here is, and, and, and it's, it's a good thing that he does that, do that, is he says this one particle state is a, is a one particle state, it's not necessarily a quantum of one of the fundamental fields of the theory. In other words, it could be a bound state. This could be, for example, let's see, I, I know you were for In other words, we could be talking about a theory of quarks and leptons and this could be a pion. All right, so that's what we've got. And now, um, now we do the uh, so in a theory like that where you have like these composite particles. Yeah. Can you uh, can you always define field operators that sort of act appropriately to create this pion in terms of the other field well, operators? Well, sure you can, but but um, I guess can you write but that? But they're not. But they they're, they're not in general simply related to the fundamental particles of so. fields of the theory. In other words, in QCD, it's yeah. very mysterious what the pi 
I see. Meson is. So you've got the, the cork field operators, mm -hmm. but there's no nice prescription for writing down the, say, the pion field operator in terms of these? Right. Huh. As far as I can know, you know what to do about that. So, this is something that Whitman's wife worked on, and <laughs> um, Chiara Whitman. There right. also there also are no guarantees that the fundamental particles themselves will come out. Maybe they only come out in bound form. Is that also? You know, true? that's an interesting thing that you just said there, and um, QCD may be an illustration of it, because in QCD, I mean, in experiments, you never see the photon. You never see the gluons. You never see the quarks. All you see are um, hadrons which are mesons, if they have an even number of quarks, and um, um, mesons, what am I saying? Mesons, if they're an even number of quarks, and baryons, if they're an odd number of quarks. And, um, so what happens if you try to find some scattering amplitude for that only involves like single quarks? I mean, you can calculate that. Yeah, and you get something that in perturbation theory that um, looks very much as though they were just leptons. And what that means is that the non-perturbative effects are enormous and people don't know what to do about them. Um, there is this lattice gauge theory and um, I suppose it's right, but um, <laughs> I've had my doubts about the approximation they use. I tried for are we gonna 20, discuss years, to, 20 years to just we can, sure. I mean, there's an aspect of what lattice gauge theory that I really like, namely the use of the Monte Carlo approach, the discretization of space time, the effort to try to actually do a functional integral. What I don't like is Wilson's Ansatz, uh, in which he compactified the gauge, he, he got rid of, the, he replaced the gauge fields with gauge fields, which are supposed to be integrated from minus infinity to plus infinity, with elements of a compact Lie group, which are um, uh, matrices that are unitary, three by three, in the case of SC3, and those things are quite bounded, whereas the gauge fields go from minus infinity to plus infinity. So the, co uh, the cognoscenti claim that it doesn't matter, I've always had my facts. All right, anyway, that's a big long tangent. Let me get on with this. So what we can do is um, do, use one of these delta functions, and what we get is minus 1 over 2 pi i. This thing sets omega equal to, let us say, uh, q10 minus p0. And so that means we have 1 over P10 minus P0, and P0 is Q1 squared plus M squared, and then plus I epsilon. So this is what we have. And then we have 0, A1 of 0, Q1, Q1, A2 of 0, 0. And now we just have delta 4 of q1 plus q2. This other delta function, this one over here, omega plus p0 is q10. So this is just q10 plus q20. So all together we have delta 4 of q1 plus q2. And that's an example of the theorem we got over here, which is that Fourier transform of the back of the mean high group, uh, of, of the Fourier transform of a P, P prime eigenstate of a time ordered product is proportional to a four dimensional delta function. When we're talking about the mean value in the vacuum, P and P prime are zero, so we just have delta fourth of K1 plus K2, which is what we've got here. All right, and then. The next thing is to say, well, 
just rationalize this denominator. Um, and uh, this is then pi, 2 pi to the 7, uh, delta 4, 2, 1 plus Q2, 0, A1 of 0, P1, P1, A2 of 0, 0. And then minus 2 root Q1 squared plus M squared. What I've done is multiply top and bottom by, well, I'll show you because this will be square root of Q1 squared plus M squared minus I epsilon squared minus Q0 squared. So we had this, we had, this is Q10 minus something. We multiply by Q10 plus something. And um, that gives us, actually, we multiply instead by the opposite of that. It's actually, and this is Q1 actually there. Um, I, let me just trip it. We're going to set Q equal to Q1, which is minus Q2. And um, so multiplying top and bottom by, um, what did I multiply by? Well, it's, all right, it's, I skipped this step. Minus Q10 minus square root of Q1 squared plus M squared plus I epsilon. Multiply top and bottom by that, you get this. And then this is, um, this of course is Q10, so you have minus 2 Q10. Alright, well this, the, the, the I epsilon comes in uh, at minus 2 I epsilon times this positive square root. So there's going to be a minus i epsilon. And then the square of that square root gives q1 squared plus m squared minus q0 squared. So altogether, this is uh, i two pi to the 7 delta 4 q1 plus q2, 0, a1 of 0. Uh, now I'm using q is equal to q1, so this is q, q, a2, 0, 0, minus 2 uh, square root of q vector squared plus m squared. And then here we have q squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. So this is the pole. All right, so this is an example of what happens if there is a, a one particle state that has non-vanishing matrix elements. These two have to be non-zero. These two matrix elements are non-zero. Then in the Fourier transform of this time-ordered product, mean value of the time order product in the vacuum, you're going to get um, a pole, a pole at uh, Q squared equal to minus M squared, where M is the mass of the one particle state that happens to have these matrix elements. So this, so what I've done is I've done the derivation, Weinberg derivation, for the case, in the simplest non-trivial case. So let me give you the more general result the more general result is the more, more general result is what one starts with um,
Well, he actually is using the time order product in the vacuum. Okay. So he's not being as general as I'm quoting him. Okay, so we're we're going to define the g of q1 qn as an integral e4 of x1 d4 of x n e to the minus i qi xi vacuum time order product p1 x1 an xn vacuum. This then, if you go through the same business as I went through, but uh, for this general case, what you get is i 2 pi to the 7, so it looks almost the same, delta 4 of now q1 plus qn, which again is an illustration, in an instance of the first theorem, well, uh, then you get effectively this whole term, but uh, as I'm writing it now, it's not yet been rationalized, so it's, it looks like this. And now sum over possible spins, and now what he has here is m zero q sigma q two q n times m q sigma zero of q r plus two dot 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 q n plus of course still other terms and. These matrix elements are the generalization of these things. That is to say, well, plus also Fourier transform integrations. I'm going to write them down over there because this this this, this black space here. So here m zero slash q sigma of q two through q r is integral d four y2 dot d4 y r e to the minus i q i y i here this is sum from 2 to r times vacuum time order product a1 of 0 dot 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 well actually it would be a little, it's a little bit trickier than this a2 of y2 dot 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 a r of y r but, uh, and now not vacuum but rather the state a state of momentum q and sigma and what are these y's? These y's are um, x i is equal to x1 plus yi. I. So in other words, we're sh translating everything by x1 in this matrix element. Um, let's not, it's not obvious what happened there. That's, that's why. All right. The other one is m q sigma slash zero of q r plus two q n. It's effectively the same thing, okay? It's the algorithm is a little more complicated. D fourth y r plus two d fourth y n e to the minus i again q k y k and then Q sigma, same Q as that one, time ordered product A R plus one zero, A R plus two, Y two, dot dot dot, A N, Y N, end of time ordered product, okay. So that's what that is. 
And so is there also some? Of course, you just rationalize. You just rationalize this thing and you get a whole. What is there also a sum over R? I mean here. Are we? Is it? Is this Q? What is this? Q two to Q R or to Q N? I'm confused, plus two to N. I'm confused about what R is. Oh, what we uh, the way I did it. All right, I, I left out, and here's the point. We're saying that this time ordered product has a zillion terms in it. Okay. All right. I can one that case identity. is one case is where x one zero through x r zero is later than x r plus one zero through x n zero, mm -hmm. and so then what you have is bunch of theta functions, a1, x1, a, r, x, r, um, and what do I call it? Q, Q sigma. And then Q sigma here, and then a, r plus 1, x, r plus 1, a, n, x, n, so it's where you're inserting the identity, right? That's where the identity is inserted. But notice, because of this time order product, you have all possible time orderings. You have all possible places where you can insert the identity operator. And um, we're only looking at the one particle states that can occur. So there are a zillion places for this to occur. So that you expect this thing to have all kinds of poles corresponding to all sorts of intermediate problems. States there. Um, so that's that's that theorem, and I'll say something about an application of that to pi on nuclear and scattering uh, beginning of next time. So I guess we can stop. And it's, uh,